the hardest leap, the most important leap is from prokaryotes to, to eukaryotes, eukaryotic. What's the second, if we're ranking? What's what's the what's uh, you gave a lot of emphasis on photosynthesis? Yeah, and I, that would be my second one, I think. But it's it's not so much. I mean, photosynthesis is part of the problem. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, again, we know it happened once. We don't know why it happened once. Um, but the fact that it was kind of taken on board completely by plants and algae and so on as, as chloroplasts and did very well in completely different environments and then on land and whatever else seems to suggest that there's no there's no problem with exploring whether you know you could have a separate origin that explored this whole domain over there that the bacteria had never gone into um so that kind of says that the reason that it only happened once is probably because it's difficult because the wiring is difficult yeah um but then it it happened at least 2.2 billion years ago, right before the GOE, maybe as long as 3 billion years ago, when there are some people say there are whiffs of oxygen, there's just kind of traces in the fossil, in the, in the, in the geochemical record that say maybe there was a bit of oxygen then. That's really disputed. Some people say it goes all the way back 4 billion years ago and, and um, that it was the common ancestor of life on Earth was photosynthetic. So immediately you've got you know, groups of people who disagree over a 2 billion year period of time about <laughs> when it started. Um, but what the, let's take the latest date when it's unequivocal. That's 2.2 billion years ago mm -hmm. through to around about the time of the Cambrian explosion when oxygen levels definitely got close to modern levels. Uh, which was around about 550 million years ago. So we've gone more than a, one and a half billion years where the Earth was in stasis. Um, nothing much changed. It's known as the boring billion, in fact. Um, uh, probably stuff was, that was when eukaryotes arose somewhere in there, but yeah. it's... Uh... So this idea that the world is constantly changing, that we're constantly evolving, that we're moving up some ramp, is a very human idea. But in reality, the, the, there there are um, there there are kind of tipping points to a new stable equilibrium, where the cells that are producing oxygen are precisely counterbalanced by the cells that are consuming that oxygen, which is why it's 21% now and has been that way for hundreds of millions of years. We have a very precise balance. You go through a tipping point and, and you don't know where the next stable state's going to be, mm -hmm. but it can be a long way from here. Um, and so if we change the world with global warming, there will be a tipping point. The question is where and when and, and what's the next stable state. It may be uninhabitable to us. It'll be habitable to life for sure. But there may be something like the Permian extinction where 95% of species go extinct and there's a five to 10 million year gap and then life recovers, but without humans. And the question statistically, well, without humans, but statistically, does that ultimately lead to greater complexity, more interesting life, more intelligent Well, life? after the first appearance of oxygen with the GOE, there was a tipping point which led to a long-term stable state that was equivalent to the Black Sea today which is to say oxygenated at the very surface and stagnant, sterile, not sterile, but um, but, but, but sulfurous, lower down. Um, and, uh, and that was stable, certainly around the continental margins, for more than a billion years. Uh, it was not a state that led to progression in an obvious way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about evolution, like what leads to stable states and uh, how often are evolutionary pressures uh, emerging from the environment. So maybe other planets are able to create evolutionary pressures, chemical pressures, whatever, some kind of pressure that say, you're screwed unless you get your shit together in the next like 10,000 years, like a yep. lot of pressure. Uh, it seems like Earth, like the boring billion might be explained in two ways. One is super difficult to take any kind of next step. And uh, the second way it could be explained is there's no reason to take the next step. No, I think that there is no reason. But at the end of it, there was a there was a snowball Earth. Um, so there was a planetary catastrophe on a huge scale where the the, the, the ice was the, the the sea was frozen at the equator, um, and that forced change. 
in, in one way or another. It's not long after that, 100 million years perhaps after that, so not a short time, but this is when we begin to see animals. There was a, a shift again, another tipping point that led to catastrophic change that led to a, 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 diff, a takeoff then. We don't really know why, but one of the reasons why that I discuss in the book um, is about sulfate being washed into the oceans, which sounds incredibly parochial. But the the issue is, I mean, the, the, what the data is showing, we can we can track roughly how oxygen was going into the atmosphere from um, from carbon isotopes. So there's two there's two main isotopes of carbon that we need to think about here. One is carbon twelve. Ninety nine percent of carbon is carbon twelve, and then one percent of carbon is carbon thirteen, which is a stable isotope. And then there's carbon fourteen, which is a trivial radioactive, it's trivial in amount. So carbon thirteen is one percent, and Life and enzymes generally, you can think of carbon atoms as little balls bouncing around, ping pong balls bouncing around. Carbon-12 moves a little bit faster than carbon-13 because it's lighter, and it's more likely to encounter an enzyme. And so it's more likely to be fixed into organic matter. And so organic matter is enriched, and this is just an observation, it's enriched in carbon-12 by uh, a few percent compared to carbon-13 relative to what you would expect if it was just equal. And... If you then bury organic matter, as coal or oil or whatever it may be, then it's no longer oxidized. So some oxygen remains left over in, in the atmosphere. And that's how oxygen accumulates in the atmosphere. And you can work out historically how much oxygen there must have been in the atmosphere by how much uh, carbon was being buried. And you think, well, how can we possibly know how much carbon was being buried? And the answer is, well, if you're burying carbon-12, what you're leaving behind is more carbon-13 in the oceans, and that precipitates out into limestone. So you can look at limestones over these ages and work out what's the carbon-13 signal. And that gives you a kind of a feedback on what the, what the oxygen content. Right before the Cambrian explosion, there was what's called a negative isotope anomaly excursion, which is basically the carbon-13 goes down by a massive amount and then back up again 10 million years later. And what that seems to be saying is the amount of carbon-12 in the oceans um, was, was disappearing, which is to say it was being oxidized. Um, and if it's being oxidized, it's consuming oxygen, and that should... So a, a big carbon-13 signal says there's, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 is, is, is really going down, which means there's, there's, there's much more carbon-12 being taken out and being oxidized. Sorry, this is getting too complex, but... Well, it's a, a, it's a good way to estimate the amount of oxygen. Yeah. If you calculate the amount of oxygen based on the assumption that all this carbon-12 that's being taken out is being oxidized by oxygen, the answer is all the oxygen in the atmosphere gets stripped out. There is none left. Yeah. Um, and yet the rest of the geological indicators say, no, there's oxygen in, in the atmosphere. So it's a kind of a paradox. And, and the only way to explain this paradox, just on mass balance of how, how much stuff is in the air, how much stuff is in the oceans and so on, um, is to assume that it, it, it was, oxygen was not the oxygen, it was sulfate. Sulfate was being washed into the oceans. It's used as an electron acceptor by sulfate-reducing bacteria, just as we use oxygen as an electron acceptor. So they pass their electrons to sulfate instead of oxygen. And, bacteria did. Yeah, yeah. So okay. these, are, these, are, these are bacteria. So they're oxidizing carbon, organic carbon, with sulfate, passing the electrons onto sulfate. That uh, reacts with iron to form iron pyrites, or fool's gold, sinks down to the bottom, gets buried out of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and this can account for the mass balance. So why does it matter? It matters because what it says is there was a chance event. Tectonically, there was a lot of sulfate sitting on land as a some kind of mineral. Uh, so calcium sulfate minerals, for example, are evaporitic. Um, and and um, because there happened to be some continent, some con continental collisions, mountain building, the, the sulfate was pushed up the side of a mountain and happened to get washed into the ocean. Yeah, so I wonder That's, how many happy accidents like that are yeah, possible. Statistically, it's really hard. You know, maybe you can roll, rule that in statistically, or rule, but, but this is the course of life on Earth. Without all that sulfate being raised up, the Cambrian explosion almost certainly would not have happened, and then we wouldn't have had animals.